Wouldn't it be nice if it were like that? Uh, I, I, I know, I thought about bringing something to clamp on it. I, I know, I, I, actually I think I may have used that one, the other one last week. But um, this will be fine. You know, for those of you that weren't here last week, you may be familiar with Vince Lombardi, the legendary coach of the Green Bay Packers. When he came to the Packers team, they were bottom dwellers 10 straight years. And pa Lombardi converted them to the dynasty that they became, which gave Green Bay the title, title town, USA. But the NFL players are the best and the most knowledgeable in the world. And yet when Lombardi took over, he had them go back to basics. And at a practice, he called everybody in. And he said, gentlemen, we're going back to the basics. This is a football. I think it's good for us sometimes to go back to the basics in our faith and our knowledge. And so the title of the message this morning is, This is Jesus. It isn't that we don't already know all the things we're going to be talking about this morning. But I think sometimes it's just good to go back and to refresh ourselves on the basics. Such as, now Hebrews chapter 3 verses 1 and 2 said, Therefore, holy brothers who share in the heavenly calling, fix your thoughts on Jesus, the apostle and high priest whom we confess. Fix your thoughts on him. And in a world that is so busy and so many things drawing our attention, it's hard to fix our thoughts on anything. But we need to fix our thoughts on Jesus completely. God has always told us to go back and to revisit important things and to have them as little posts along the way so lest we forget or lest things fade in importance. And I hope that this morning, that this message will refresh a lot of things for you, that it will increase your faith and joy, and that it will make communion at the end more meaningful. Who is Jesus? Kind of a silly question to ask here, isn't it? But who is Jesus? At Christmas, Jesus is a baby in a manger. That's how we picture him, isn't it? Everywhere we see a babe in the manger. At Easter... Jesus is the one who was scourged, who was crucified, who died and who raised from the dead. But let's look at some other awesome things about the Lord that maybe we don't think about quite as often. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 20 and 21 says, He was chosen before the creation of the world, but was revealed in these last times for your sake. Through him you believe in God, who raised him from the dead and glorified him, and so your faith and hope are in God. But note that, before the creation of the world, you know, Jesus is more than a babe in a manger. He's more than a man who died on a cross. Jesus is so awesome, and he, he showed himself to us as a man. But that doesn't begin Everything he did there doesn't begin to talk about how awesome, how powerful, how great Jesus really is. In John 8, 58, Jesus said about himself, I tell you the truth. Before Abraham was born, I am. Jesus didn't have a beginning. And, you know, we just have a hard time wrapping our minds around something like he always was. As God always was. Jesus always was. He was at the right hand of God. And remember when he prayed for the disciples in the 17th chapter of John, how he prayed that they could see the glory that he had with God the Father before all this. He's awesome. In Genesis chapter 1, Verse 1, it says, in the beginning, God, God created the heavens and the earth. Hey, I am not a Hebrew scholar. 
I can't read any Hebrew at all. I do better in Greek, but I'm not a Greek scholar either. But we have a, here a compound unity. God, this God, when he said, like, let's, let's make man our own image. See, Jesus is the one that did it all through God. God did it through Jesus. The same Jesus that we think about as in a manger. The same Jesus that we think about having healed the sick and raised the dead and, and dying on a cross. He is the one who actually made the universe. Isn't that an amazing thing? Unimaginable power, unimaginable love. Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 through 20 says, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, heaven and earth. Visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things were created by him and, mark this, and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood on the cross. This is Jesus. Before he came to die for our sins, every religious practice among God's people were only a shadow of things to come. He came to free us from from slavery to sin and to death, the consequences of it. God's people, Israel, were in Egypt as slaves. And Moses was sent by God to free them. God would use him. God would work miracles through him. God would give directions through him and guidance through him. Nine times, God worked plagues on Egypt. Nine times, Pharaoh's heart was hardened. And he would not let the people be free. Then God said there would be one more, a tenth plague, and now he will let the people go. This plague was to be the death of the firstborn. Every firstborn male in Egypt that wouldn't be covered by the blood of the lamb would die. So God told Moses on the 10th day of this month, which was to be the first month from that point on of their calendar, to take each family, or if you had too few in your family, get together a family because you needed to consume the whole lamb that night. Choose a male from among the sheep or the goats without blemish and set it aside. This would be the sacrifice. And on the 14th, they would slaughter the lambs and they would have a Passover feast. And that Passover feast was to be a memorial. From that time on, every year, the Jews would celebrate this Passover feast. And the children would ask questions, and they would answer, lest they forget, lest it become less important over time. One thing was that they were to take the blood of the lamb, and they were to paint it on the doorpost, all three sections. And in that land, that night, Every household experienced death except those who were covered by the blood of the Lamb. That was a picture, a shadow of what was to come. Jesus created the universe and mankind knowing that there would come a time when he himself, the awesome creator of all this, would come as a human being, as a man himself, the Lamb of God, the perfect sacrifice, and would offer himself to suffer the most cruel death that has ever been devised by man, to be crucified. It's a terrifying death. The Romans used to crucify people along busy highways so that everybody would be afraid to do anything that would upset Rome. Today, we find that there are Muslims in Africa and in the Mideast that are actually crucifying people again for the same reason. Their hatred and also this thing of terrifying people. 
It's a horrible thing. Jesus not only paid the price and suffered this death for us, but God made sure that we could know it was true. That we could know that this is exactly the way it was. This is what was set up before God ever created the universe, before he ever created human beings, before any of this time, that Jesus was going to come. This is all part of God's plan. It was a necessity so we could be adopted as children, co-heirs with Christ, and spend eternity with God. What a, great, what a great thing that we would have such a privilege. Even to have life. Isn't that a great privilege? Well, one of the ways he did it was predictive prophecy. Peter W. Stoner wrote a book back in the 60s or 70s, whatever it was, called Science Speaks. And in that, he wanted to go back and examine these predictive prophecies because the Jews, the rabbis, had said that there were about 300 prophecies that fit the Messiah as they gleaned the scriptures and that the Messiah, when he came, would have to fulfill all these things so that they would know that he truly was the Messiah. So Stoner took only eight of these with his group of people, and they were very conservative, and they were going to use mathematical probability to give us what kind of a possibility someone would have. How about if parents decided that they wanted to have their son fulfill these things, or have just by happenstance? Well, they took eight things that were simple, like being born in Bethlehem. What chance would they have from then till now of uh, a boy being born in Bethlehem. And of course, there were a lot of other things that weren't considered in this one, like being crucified, being betrayed for 30 pieces of silver, having the 30 pieces of silver thrown down in the temple, all these different things. He only took eight things out of all of them. And then they decided what chance there would be. Well, mathematical probability said that only eight things, being very conservative, you would have one chance and 10 to the 17th power. That means you put 17 zeros after that 10. Now, what kind of a number is that? <laughs> bigger than my bank account. <laughs> Even bigger than the national debt. <laughs> but if you want to understand mathematical probability, inside this box are 10 pennies. I've numbered them, 1 through 10. Now, if I shake up that box, and I want to reach in there without looking, I'm going to pick up penny number one, if I can find them in that got a big box. I got one penny. What chance would I have of picking up penny number one? One chance in ten. Now, if I get penny number one and I put it back in, being able to draw penny number one and then followed it by penny number two, I've got one chance in a hundred because it's ten times ten. You know, it keeps multiplying. Well, let's see what I got. Penny number eight. See, uh, well, okay, so... But now, you think about this as one chance in 10 to the 17th power. Now, if you were to play the lottery, I don't know if anybody won last night or not, but the chance of winning the Powerball, I looked it up on, online, one in 175 million. Maybe that wouldn't have been a good investment for me. I didn't even get one in 10. <laughs> but the lottery is a slam dunk compared to what we're talking about here, that he could fulfill only eight prophecies. Now, let's put this in terms that we can understand. We'll mark a silver dollar with something. And we're going to have that number of silver dollars, and we're going to uh, take it to the state of Texas and stir it all up. And nobody knows quite where the silver dollar is, but we're going to spread them out a little bit so you can find it, and it covers a whole state two feet thick. Now, Texas is a big state. I discovered that when I was in the Air Force. We had been in Lackland, Texas, and uh, basic training, and we were going to Denver for more schooling. And so we got on a train, a sleeper train, and that seems strange, going only to Denver, we need a sleeper train, but we got on that, and we traveled. We watched St. Rain, we went to sleep that night, got up the next morning, looked out the window, and where are we? We're in Texas. This is huge. So, the chance that they would have of only fulfilling eight of these prophecies if it wasn't God controlling it would be one chance and one and ten to the 17th power. So they stirred up all this, and put a blindfold on somebody, they can walk as far as they want in any direction. And when they reach down in this thing and select a coin to pull it up, and that's the chance that they would find that marked coin. 
Well, I didn't find coin number one in my little box of 10 pennies. So, you see, it is so overwhelming, and God is so good, and that he gives us all of these facts and all of these proofs so we can know. But let's go to the upper room. It's Passover time in Jerusalem. Luke chapter 22, verses 7 and 8, and 14 through 20 says, Then came the day of unleavened bread in which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. Jesus sent Peter and John, saying, Go and make preparations for us to eat the Passover. When the hour came, Jesus and his disciples, his apostles, reclined at the table, and he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat the pas this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. After taking the cup, he gave thanks and said, Take, take this and divide it among you. For I tell you, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread, gave thanks, and broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. Here we have God's lamb. He's known as the lamb of God in scripture to us. The sacrificial lamb is conducting the Passover meal. He's telling what he's going to do. But this is what he's done for them, for us. Every Passover before that time, all of the hundreds of thousands of lambs whose blood had been poured out was only a shadow of this moment. And this Passover supersedes all other Passovers. This time of the Lord's Supper has replaced that because it's no longer a shadow. Now of something that was to come, Jesus did it. He was going to sacrifice himself and he did for us, for our sins. They, they slaughtered the Passover lamb between the hours of three and six for each of the families. But every day they slaughtered in the temple a lamb at three o'clock in the afternoon for the sins of the people. Guess what time Jesus died on the cross? Three o'clock. This is the Passover lamb given by God. God is in control. God's love shines through to us, and this is Jesus. He knew before he created us that for us to spend eternity with him in heaven, he had to go through all this, and he did. Now, how about today? How about tomorrow? What about Jesus then? 1 Corinthians 15, verses 20 through 28 says, but Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead comes also through a man. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. But each in his own turn, Christ the first fruits, then when he comes, those who belong to him, then the end will come when he hands over the kingdom to God the Father after he has destroyed all dominion, authority, and power. Mark this about this Jesus, the one we see in the manger and we see in the cross and we see healing and raising the dead and those things. It says, for he must reign until he has put all of his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death, for he has put everything under his feet. Now, when it, it says that everything has been put under him, it is clear that this does not include God himself, who put everything under Christ. When he has done this, then the Son himself will be made subject to him who will put everything under him so that God may be 
all in all. This Jesus is so awesome, so powerful beyond imagination. He created everything. Last week, we looked at the little things like DNA and things like that, and we're learning more and more about the complicated, specific things that he has made that, and the world itself, how everything has to be just perfect for a life to begin. This was God's design, and this was Jesus. And it is awesome not only to realize his power and his love, but to think about it. He was willing to come and to die for us so we could live with him. That's almost unimaginable, isn't it? And he's love. And those who love him and who obey him are promised to spend eternity with him. Hey, we're going to be co-heirs with Christ Jesus. Have you ever thought what it meant to be a co-heir with Christ? I can't imagine that. Everyone wanted to be an heir of Howard Hughes when he died. Because he didn't leave a will. So everybody made up wills. I don't know what happened to his money. I didn't get it. But then again, I didn't make up a will. But the fact is, Howard Hughes, Bill Gates, anybody you can imagine, are paupers compared to what it is to be a co-heir with Christ Jesus. We're even told that we don't know what our bodies are going to be like, but they're going to be like his. Isn't that fantastic? And that doesn't end. We don't have pains. We don't have sorrows. We don't have any of that. All of that is possible because this awesome Jesus died for our sins. You know, life is fleeting. I don't know if you're a Christian this morning or not. I don't know if you're a child of God or not. Hopefully you are. But if you're not, this morning you can receive the greatest gift imaginable too. The gift of eternal life. That's what it's all about. And even the angels in heaven will rejoice. Not just us with you, but even the angels in heaven. So I would say we're going to sing a hymn now. And we're going to stand and sing that hymn. And, and if you have not gotten your relationship with the Lord straight yet, if you're not yet absolutely positive you're a child of God, come forward and let us talk with you, pray with you, and help you to get that accomplished. Don't leave here without that. Isn't Jesus awesome? More than a man. God in the flesh. The Son of God the one in control of everything right now. And he loves us. He calls us his brothers. Will you stand and let's, let's sing.